Depression can present in many ways. Some severely depressed people will look severely depressed. Others will look as if their mood is completely normal. The history is all important. The questions are of key importance in helping to define the type of mood disorder that an individual presents with. I usually recommend starting very broadly and then progressively refining the questions, chasing hypotheses and trying to exclude differing possible diagnoses. This following interview with Jessica will give some idea of a process where we start broad and progressively narrow down until the mood disorder subtype is identified and clarified. So Jessica, how can I help you? Uh, well, I've been having depression now for a few years. Mm -hmm. So far, nothing's helped me. I, I just, I feel like there has to be something better than this. Okay, so what do we focus on the depression, first of all? And maybe if we'll look at the key symptoms that you've experienced and we can look at them either for your current episode or maybe for any previous episode when they've been at the worst. So what have been the features that you found that resonate best with you to describe the depression? Well, I felt extremely hopeless. Mm -hmm. It's an overwhelming sadness. Mm -hmm. uh, very tired. And I think the worst part is, is uh, I'm avoiding the people I love. So let me just, just go through a couple of those. When you said tiredness, is it tiredness or a lack of energy? It's a, it's a lack of energy. Right. So do you, do you find it may be hard to get out of bed and get going at all? Absolutely. Right. Um, just to get going into the day, mm, mm. I find quite difficult. And would that go to the extent where you might not get out of bed and have a bath or shower? Yep. Yeah. And that would be unusual for you? Normally, yeah. Right. That's not my personality. Yeah. Okay. And, and when it's at its worst, can you be cheered up if something nice happens? On occasions. Mm-hmm. Completely? No. Right. And are you fully cheered up or is it just partial cheer up? Uh, it's superficial. Yeah. I feel like it's forced. Yes. Okay. And what about pleasure in life? When you're depressed, does that get changed? Mm. Yeah, I've, I find it uh, difficult to have fun. Normal things that I find interesting. Yes. Um, or going out with friends, for instance, I, uh, I usually find some reason not to go. So you become quite asocial and you'd avoid even your best friends? Mm. What about if you're in a relationship with your partner? Would you feel more needy or would you tend to keep back from the partner? Um, I become a bit more distant. Yeah, OK. And what about your appetite and any weight changes? Um, my weight actually fluctuates. Does it? Yeah. Uh, I find when I'm feeling this way, when I'm depressed, I don't have much of an appetite. Mm -hmm. And then if it goes up, is that because you're eating cruddy foods or um, do you get any food cravings? or? Yeah, right. yeah, I do. Right, so the appetite can go up and it can go down. Yes. What about your sleep pattern when you're severely depressed? Um... I find it difficult to go to sleep. Right. But then I find it difficult to wake up. Okay. Do you find that your mood and energy level varies across the day? Is it worse mornings or evenings? Or is there no pattern? Mornings are worse. Morning are worse. Definitely worse yeah. in the mornings. Okay. What about your concentration? I love to read and um, I can't get past the first few pages. Mm -hmm. Watching television doesn't... It doesn't hold my attention. Mm-hmm. Okay. Typing emails, even. Right. OK. Do you, do you feel slowed down at all when you're depressed? Um, 
walking, talking, thinking. Mm. What does that feel like? It's like, it's like walking through sand. Yes, right. Do you ever get any times when you might rub your hands or pace up and down and, and feel agitated? No. no. So it's more of a slowing down. Yeah. yeah. And at your worst, do you get any suicidal thoughts? On occasions, yeah. Right. Can you tell me a bit more about that? Um, well, it's a horrible feeling. Feeling like uh, you can't really escape this sadness. So I mm. have planned a few episodes what I might do. Have you? Mm -hmm. I haven't... I haven't followed through, so I don't think it's got out of control yet. Right. Do you feel that you've been at risk at any time in the past of harming yourself? Um, yes. I woke up one morning, it was probably about three in the morning, and I just wanted to run out on the street and step in front of a, of a vehicle. Right. Just to hope that I might get hit. Right. And what about during the current episode? Are, are you at risk at the moment, do you think? Um, well, I'm here, mm -hmm. so I feel like I'm doing something good for myself. Okay. Jessica, do you, when you're severely depressed, do you ever have times when you might get strange tastes or smells or no. hear things or see things or no, misinterpret nothing. things? Nothing no, like nothing that. like that. Okay. Um, now, the depression, do you feel that it can be explained by stresses that are going on in your life or does the depression seem disproportionate to the, the stress that you're experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, disproportionate is a good word because uh, mm -hmm. I'll have these triggers but they never seem to... Um, match up with the deepness of the depression. Right, so the depression is far more severe than would be explained by the stress, as you, as you yes. feel it. Yes, yeah. yeah. for instance, the other week I got a, a call from an aunt who I haven't yep. spoken to mm -hmm. in a while and conversation would have only been 30 seconds and within the, within the hour I felt so low and the next two days I couldn't mm -hmm. get out of that. Right, mm. okay. And how long have you been having depressive episodes? From what age? Um, well, probably my, my late teens. Okay. Mm. And they last, on average, how long? Um, a week. Right. Okay. And what treatments have you had over time? Well, I've seen a couple of GPs. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen a psychiatrist, I've seen a psychologist. Uh, I've had counselling. Mm -hmm. I've had CBT, that didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. um, Did counselling help at all? Counselling it helped helped me deal with the depression, but it didn't it didn't fix it. Right. Mm. Okay. And any medication uh, for the depression at all? Uh, two antidepressants, right. SSRIs. Okay. I think. And can you tell me a bit more about them? How long you had them for, for instance? Uh, one. Um, uh, that I was on for about about four months. Right. Found that lifted a little bit. Yes. But I, I didn't like it because there were quite a lot of side effects so mm -hmm. I agreed with my doctor to stop it. Yep. I had another one and that didn't do anything. Okay. Um, so you were on one for over a month but not much benefit and a number of side effects. Yeah, the yep. first one I was on, yep. not much benefit. Okay. And that was about three and a half months. That was a fair time, okay. At this stage, Jessica's story is very suggestive of a melancholic depression. 
She describes episodes coming on at a particular time, so there's a trend break. The episodes are associated with poor concentration, an antidonic and non-reactive mood. She hasn't responded to CBT. This sounds very much like a biological depression. The key next issue, logically, to my mind, is to try to work out whether there's any bipolar pattern or whether this is a unipolar melancholia. However, I need to say that it is important to screen for bipolar in all people with a mood disorder because it's not only those with clear-cut melancholia where a bipolar disorder can be a possibility. In trying to clarify the possibility of a bipolar diagnosis, I'm really focusing in three areas. One is on the symptom pattern. I'm wanting that the individual has experienced a number of distinctive hypermanic or manic features. Secondly, I'm looking for a trend break. That is, the individual will say, this came on at a certain age and wasn't there before, or at least wasn't particularly obvious. Thirdly, it has to be different to normal happiness or enthusiasm. It has to be distinctive in terms of its severity. And of course, one has to differentiate other possibilities, such as personality style, ADHD, alcohol or drug abuse, and other factors. Now, just changing tracks a little bit, apart from the times that you are depressed and the times when your mood is back to normal, do you ever have any times which feel different in the sense that you're more energised and wired? Absolutely. Right. Tell me a bit more about that. I feel fantastic. Mm -hmm. The sky's the limit, so to speak. Um, I feel I could do anything. Right. And you, sounds like you feel more confident? Yep. Definitely. So how would that play out on a day-to-day -day basis when you're feeling super confident? What sort of things might you think or might you do? Um, at work, I feel dynamic. Yes. I feel like I'm a step ahead of everything. Yep. And a step ahead of everyone. Right. Um, um, I feel like... Within my relationships, everything's great. Mm -hmm. I feel very attractive mm -hmm. and um, very vivacious. Okay, you become more talkative? Yeah. Can't shut me up. Right, so loud? On occasions, yes. Right. More playful? Yes. How won't that come through? Well, I find if I go to a party with some friends, uh, I usually like to be the life of the party. Right. So I like to so, yeah. entertain. And, and would your friends pick this up, that there's something different about you in terms of that energy, that, that playfulness? Would, would they ever say anything to you on drugs or you're loud or do they just see that as part of your personality? The way they know me, it's like it is part of my personality. But my partner picks up on it and he thinks I'm just totally full of myself. Right. Okay. During those times, do you, does your sleep pattern change? Mm. Yeah, I only need um, two, three hours. Right. And that's would you, all I need. That's all you need, so you wouldn't feel tired. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you become indiscreet at all? Do things that you might regret, like tell the boss off or say something to somebody or have a tattoo that you might not really think about uh, as ideal later? Um... Well, I have told the boss off. Mm -hmm. During some of the some mood state like that. Yes, yeah. and uh, um, tattoo. Yes, yep. I have, have a tattoo right. that I've been wanting to remove. Yep. Um, about two years ago, I was walking past a barber shop and just chopped off all my hair. Right. Okay. Because I you... felt like it would have been a better look. Okay. Would you spend more money at those times? Definitely. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, Can you give us an example of that? I don't have a lot of money, yeah. but I can walk past a shop and pretty much purchase an entire new wardrobe. Mm -hmm. All sorts of outfits and shoes, mm -hmm. hats, makeup even. Um, I can nearly max out a credit card. Right. Mm -hmm. I have to return most of it which is quite embarrassing. Right, okay. And, and what happens to your normal levels of anxiety during these up moods? What, what happens then? 
Well, sky's the limit. There is no worries, right. so to speak. I right. feel great. So it's a carefree zone in many ways. Absolutely. Okay. And can you think of a time when you started to have these up moods, in a particular age? Again, probably, probably in my late teens. Right. So around the time that the depression started. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And how long would they last on average? Two, three days. So I think you said earlier the depressions can last about a week, so these up moods last a couple of days. Mm. Do you have much time in the middle um, apart from these mood swings? Um, yeah, on occasion. Mm -hmm. So what percentage of the time do you think you might over a year be depressed and what percentage of the time highly energetic and what percentage of the time quite normal? Um, well, I know that if I have an up mood, yep. that I'm going to have a d deep depression following it. Right. So I'd say maybe um, one quarter up. Yes. Um, maybe half down. Yes. And then the rest is sort of normal. Right. And what impact has this had on your life since late adolescence um, with your mood swinging it as it has been? I feel like my life has just been a constant up and down. Mm. I've had what it feels like is zero control mm -hmm. over my life. Mm. I've had a number of relationships that have stopped and started mm -hmm. and um, it's just been inconsistent. Sure. And, and what uh, about your work? Uh, sorry, you're going to say something? Oh, I just feel exhausted. Right. Have the mood swings caused you to lose any jobs or compromised your career? Um, I've quit a few jobs that were, when yes. I look back on it, going reasonably well. Yeah. And um, there was no need to really quit them. Right. And w what diagnoses have you had in the past for this mood condition? Um, well... Pretty much all doctors have said I have a major depression. Right. Um, one doctor said I may have had a borderline personality disorder. Right. And um, another doctor said I may have ADHD. Right. Maybe we just go through those last couple. Um, before all this came on in adolescence, as a kid were you able to read books and concentrate? Absolutely. So there's no attention or hyperactivity as part of your early childhood, no. nothing like that? No. Okay. okay. And, and borderline personality, what do you feel about that? Um, I do not feel that I'm borderline personality. Right. So your relationships over time have been pretty good ones? You maintain relationships? Um, Keep friends? Well, I have lost a few friends along the way yeah. and I have lost a few relationships. Right. Any history taking of a mood disorder obviously needs to be complemented by obtaining a lot of other information. We need to know something about the person, their life trajectory, whether they were exposed to developmental stresses, abuses. Is there a family history of mood disorder? Is there a drug and alcohol problem? Is there an anxiety disorder? Are there medical problems? Are there allergies? And a whole series of other factors that may be known to the general practitioner, but for others they may need to be identified and examined uh, at the initial interview. We've gone through the history and we've looked at your family history and we've looked at a number of possible explanations and drugs and alcohol don't seem to be relevant and we've covered the possibilities of ADHD and anxiety and personality problems and it, it really does seem to me to be a pretty clear pattern of what we these days would call a bipolar 2 condition and that's uh, really where the mood disorder has ups and downs or highs and lows. It's uh, not manic depression, um, that was a term that we now have reframed and we call that bipolar one but in taking your history you seem to me to have absolutely clear-cut 
highs and lows that meet what we would call a bipolar 2 condition. You've mm. never had any psychotic experiences when you've been up or down. Mm. And you've had a pretty clear onset of mood swings and they are distinctive and they're impairing. And uh, generally we recommend a broad approach for bipolar, medication, education, and then a well-being plan. Mm. So what I want to do is just take you through each of those components. Making a diagnosis of bipolar disorder or clarifying the possibility are really important issues uh, for medical practitioners. Bipolar disorder is a condition that's associated with a lot of collateral damage. People lose years of their life. It affects their close relationships. It affects their capacity to work. They're much more likely to have problems with drug and alcohol. But when a diagnosis is made, then the great majority can expect benefit. Sometimes the diagnosis is pretty straightforward and if the right questions are asked, it's almost undeniable. Other times we need assistance. There are a number of options. The Black Dog Institute has a measure that people complete on the web that gives some estimate of the probability. And there are a lot of other measures of that type that can be useful for clarification. Other patients where the diagnosis is less clear cut may need referral to a psychiatrist who has an interest in mood disorders or to a specialist facility that focuses on issues of diagnosis and also in terms of the management options, which are multiple. As in managing other mood disorders, managing people with bipolar conditions is extremely rewarding and it's important that we offer an optimistic prognosis at the end of that assessment and clarification of the diagnosis. However, there is a caveat and it's important to state to the patient that while they may expect to have their mood disorder brought under complete control or nearly complete control, this won't necessarily be achieved with the first medication, the second or even the third. But it's important to acknowledge that this journey is an extremely rewarding one.